but he, these are these are mostly parents. Mostly parents. Good afternoon and welcome to our What's Buzzing at Georgia Tech webinar series. Today, we are talking about navigating Georgia Tech as a black student in honor of Black History Month. Uh, we have some very special guests with us here today. Uh, we have some students, so some staff uh, who work in the Division of Student Life. Um, just as a formality, please know that uh, this session will be recorded. So if you miss anything or if you want to pass this along to a fellow parent, a friend or family member, please know that you can access this recording on our website, parents.gatech.edu. Also, if you have any questions for our panelists, our students, or Dean Ray, please feel free to utilize the Q&A chat box, which should be off to your right. Um, just drop in those questions, comments. We, we are here today to kind of get a conversation started and a dialogue um, just about navigating Georgia Tech as a Black student. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dean Stephanie Ray. Thank you, Tyler. Good afternoon and welcome to Parent and Family Programs webinar series navigating Georgia Tech as a black student. My name is Stephanie Ray and I serve the Institute as Associate Dean of Students and Director for Student Diversity Programs. I also lead the inclusion area in student life, which includes not only student diversity programs, but the LGBTQIA Resource Center, the Women's Resource Center, and the Veterans Resource Center. And I've been here at Tech for 24 years. I'm excited that we have some very well qualified students to serve on a panel. I want to first share with you the mission statement for our collective. As a collective, we are grounded in social justice, equity, and we support the holistic growth of all students, faculty and staff through individual, interpersonal, and cultural development that leads to a more inclusive Georgia Tech community. We also engage in advocacy, values-based education, celebration, and programming centering inter on intersectionality, learning, collaboration, and inclusion. At this time, I'm gonna let you meet these wonderful students and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you. Let's start by hearing from Clinton Smith. Hi, Clinton. Hi, Dean Ray. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Clinton Smith. I'm a third year biomedical engineering major minoring in health medicine and society. Um, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I grew up in Atlanta uh, ever since the age of six. And uh, I'm excited to be on this panel. Thank you, Clinton. Let's hear from Salmata. Hi, Dean Ray. Thank you for having us. I'm Salmata Berry. I'm a third year from North Carolina studying electrical engineering with a thread in bioengineering. Uh, currently undergrad research assistant and provost scholar at Tech and serving as an m, &M mentor in our women in engineering department and as well as publications chair for our Nesby chapter here. Thank you, Salmata. Julian, Julian Rose. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Rose. I'm originally from Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a third year PhD student in biomedical engineering. I'm a former assistant at the student, student diversity programs. Um, and I'm involved in a whole lot of other things within my department, um, including a lab leaders initiative. So I can say more about that later, but I really, really appreciate y'all for being here. Thank you, Julian. We have another student, Morgan Wright, who is attempting to join, but can't get in. Let me see. I'm sending her another request, but we will go on with our program as planned. I have a set list of questions, but I'm encouraging parents and our guests, when you have a question, feel free to put the question in the chat and we'll stop what we're doing and answer that question for you. So I don't want that thought to, to leave. To my students, what are some challenges unique to black students, first of all, on 
what we call PWIs, meaning predominantly white campuses. So what do you think are some challenges unique to black students on PWIs? Just step right in. You don't have to yeah, raise your hand. No one's okay, cool. Um, I think one thing that is pretty unique is uh, pretty much finding a sense of belonging on campus at a PWI. Of course, um, African Americans have a very layered history in uh, the United States, and um, Typically, when we're in predominantly white spaces, there can be a lot of triggers and um, a lot of things reminiscent of history that take place. So I think uh, figuring out whether or not you feel as if you belong is uh, a pretty unique challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Clinton. Anyone else want to answer that question? Thank you, Julian. Go ahead. Yeah, I can add. Um, I think that the years that you're in college frequently are years of great um, growth and development. And I think that as a result of that, doing that in a, but I'm going to use the word hostile, but not in the, you know, most common connotations of the word, but in an environment where, like Clinton is talking about, there is not an immediate sense of belonging around something as impactful as race for you to be doing development and identity development at in a space like that it put puts pressures on your your identity development um and i think that as you leave college that forces you to do some extra work around your racial identity um, that maybe other folks at other schools uh, may not need to do in the same way um, and some healing really so i think that's something that um, black students, black parents should absolutely be aware of and kind of be preparing students for in general. Thank you, Julian. Students, do you think that there are some unique challenges to being a black student at Georgia Tech? We talked about being a black student at a PWI, but what about being at Georgia Tech overall? Are there, Salmata. Yeah, I'll say especially at Georgia Tech with it being like right in the center of Atlanta, it's definitely a unique experience. Um, I would say code switching definitely happens a lot. If you just go a little ways off campus, the experience is a lot different than maybe in your courses. And even so with us being, I believe like 7% of the school as black students, um, it's a lot easier. I think as an underclassman, since you have typically a larger amount of students in your courses, but definitely that imposter syndrome kicks in as you get your higher level classes and those numbers start to tick down as your courses, as your class size gets smaller. So I think that's unique to Georgia Tech. Thank you. Julian. Yeah, I think that um, Georgia Tech markets itself as an elite university. Um, and I think it benefits from that and students benefit from that in a lot of ways. And at the same time, uh, elitism is to some extent necessarily exclusionary. And so um, that those like concepts of exclusion around, you know, performance and things like that make it more difficult to, for example, struggle as a student, you know, regular struggles. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this in contrast to, to University of Connecticut, which was my alma mater, um, that is just a land grant public university founded in 1881. Um, and they didn't they they weren't really like marketing themselves as like an elite place necessarily. Um, so I also think, you know, going to an elite college that is situated in the south um, and therefore has all these like socio-political um, connections, right, to, to governance and things like that, puts pressures on the campus that are unique um, <laughs> because of the location. Thank you for that transparency, Julian. 
And now I'm excited that our other uh, student has, has is able to join us. Yay! So Morgan Wright, I'm so glad you're here. So first of all, if you could just tell us a little bit about you. Introduce yourself to the audience, please. Yeah, no problem. And I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties. But um, yes, my name is Morgan Wright. I'm a second year mechanical engineering major and I have a minor in industrial design. Um, on campus, I, um, I'm an edge mentor through OMED and I'm also a women of color ambassador. And then I am the pre-collegiate initiative chair for Georgia Tech Society of Black Engineers. Thank you, Morgan. We're so glad to have, have you. Some of the initial questions that were asked in case you wanted to give some feedback, or what are some challenges that maybe some black students face attending a predominantly white institution or what are some unique challenges a black student may face at Georgia Tech? Um, I will say definitely. Well, I know personally, like I came from majority black high school, majority black middle school and some. So when it came to like coming to Georgia Tech, it was kind of a culture shock in a sense because, you know, I'm just used to essentially, you know, being around and working with people who look like me. And so I will say that was, you know, a slight adjustment. And then also with Georgia Tech and it being a PWI, it's, it's so big. Like, I think what a lot of my like freshman like lectures were like, you know, 200 people like packed in like an auditorium. So like definitely I can see like getting the help that you need on campus can be really, really hard because if, you know, you don't ask questions or you don't go out and seek what you need, then you're not going to get it. So I will say definitely that something that I see like students troubling with, like having trouble with is, you know, basically out the gate, like reaching out, getting the help they need. Also, you know, with big class sizes, just kind of reaching out to their peers and mentors, even if they don't know them. And, you know, it might be kind of uncomfortable, but it's really important to build that support system while you're at Tech, I will say 100%. I'm going to pose this one to Julian, and maybe you've, you spoke to this a little bit, but I think transfer students may have a similar answer to a graduate student because you were a new student to tech after being somewhere else. But are there, were there any, or have there been unique challenges that you have faced as a graduate student that you didn't experience as an undergrad? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think that a lot of uh, university programming is very tailored to making sure undergraduate students feel connected to the broader campus um, and not necessarily for graduate students. So in order to feel that connection, in order to feel that sense of home on a campus, you really need to um, work. I, I, I remember uh, the first couple of weeks when I came on campus, I walked around the campus and literally was like looking for black students. I kid you not. <laughs> and people were like, yeah, find the OMID office. And I was like, OK, but where is that? Um, and then they were like, yeah, go to BSO and then go to the student, you know, student diversity programs office. Right. And I was literally just walking around roaming the campus um, because I realized very quickly that graduate students were not going to be getting the emails about certain events and all these things because um, we're like, you know, kind of locked up in our labs, generally speaking, um, and don't really have to venture out unless we need to like if, unless we need to come up for air or to eat or something like that. Um, so absolutely, there are unique challenges as graduate students. I think the other thing is like, who is holding you accountable? Um, I think undergraduate students have a little bit more freedom to test things out, test out their own strategies of, of productivity and all these things. Graduate students, you have an advisor, which means you have a boss. Um, and so you have a little bit less leeway to kind of find yourself, find your place on the campus, all these things, because you're you're very focused on what your advisor uh, needs you to do and all those things. Thank you, Julian. I think you brought up a very um, a good point. Holding yourself accountable. Yes, graduate students need to hold themselves accountable, but sooner than later, undergraduate students are going to have to do that as well. When I take about four or five students under my wing each semester and give them a little bit of coaching. And one of the things that I do is I teach students to hold them accountable. And I will hold them accountable until they're able to hold themselves accountable. So holding yourselves accountable 
is essential in being successful in college. So thanks for saying that. And not everyone is good at it, right? It's something that you have to learn. And I just want students to, to not have to learn the hard way. I want them to get it. So, so I, I want you to, to start practicing that. So you brought up a very good question. It's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you. So I'm new on campus. You know, maybe I'm a first year or I'm a transfer, or maybe I just wasn't active in the fall. And God knows we have COVID, right? So how do I find other Black students on campus? How do I go about finding students who look like me? Clinton. Sure, I think um, I can answer that. Um, and I think it's interesting because I happen to know like all three of my other uh, co-panelists. So I think I'm, I might be, I guess, an expert at meeting black students on campus. But um, uh, I think one thing I did was I did a, a summer bridge program known as Challenge and it's run through OMED, which um, has been mentioned before. And it's basically, like four weeks of uh, basically taking really intense courses, getting a feel for what the worst case scenario would be like your first semester at Georgia Tech, and you're surrounded by other minority students. And um, I think in my particular class, it was predominantly black. So that was at least 100 other black students that I interacted with for an entire month. And that's actually how I met Morgan. I'm a year older than her, but I was kind of like a tutor for uh, computer science and, and math uh, for her particular challenge cohort. And um, I helped and I was able to meet another group, another hundred students uh, just from that one summer. So uh, that's one way. And there are also a plethora of clubs that you can join. Um, the National Society for Black Engineers is another really big uh, association for Black students specifically, and Samata and Morgan are um, our membership, well not membership chairs, but they're uh, a part of the executive board, so they can probably talk a little bit more about that too. So I'm going to put in a plug for OMED Educational Services. When I was doing some research for this panel discussion, I already knew this, but it's always good to have the research, right? Have the numbers. So students who participate, black students who participate in challenge and other underrepresented students also participate in challenge. And also students who are supported by the African-American Male Initiative that is also offered through OMED end up having higher GPAs than other black students who don't. And I think that's important to make note of that, that these, that these, um, that these programs are very successful. We have some questions from the audience. Let me see, let me, so those students are connected to OMED before we move on. I'd like one of you to speak maybe to how beneficial OMED has been to you personally. Okay. Um, yeah, I definitely feel like I can take that one. So yeah, like Clinton said, I did the challenge program uh, when I came in as a freshman. That definitely prepared me for you know my freshman year and like taking some of those really difficult classes. And also another thing that OMED has that really really helped me is tutoring. So I know you can do one on one tutoring through the Coke or drop in tutoring, but you know, that's everybody on campus and it can be really, really busy and it can be really, really hard to schedule an appointment. Um, you know, versus OMED, it's kind of, you know, it's much smaller, it's, you know, mostly minority students. So when it comes to tutoring, like, you know, you get the help that you need instantly. And I really, really appreciate that. I really like that because with, I, like, with my tutors, like I definitely, you know, built a bond with a lot of them. I feel like they also like taught me the information better because it's on a smaller scale versus the Coke and you know, tutors have like 50, you know, kids probably in one setting. And then also another thing that OMED does that I really appreciate is around finals time, they do on um, like 12 hour study halls. And so all the tutors are, you know, well, when it was in person, all the tutors would be there, they would have food and you know, you can go to different rooms to get tutoring, even though, you know, with COVID they still, made it happen. They did it virtually and I still feel like it was a big success. And then also for, you know, new students on campus, 
even though we're still in COVID times, OMED is still open. So, you know, you can still come in, you can still get tutoring in person or virtual, whatever, you know, works best to you. Cause actually I'm doing this call from OMED. So, you know, definitely um, a good workspace on campus is OMED if, you know, you're sick of like sitting in your room and stuff like that. Thank you, Morgan. Julian, what are some of the questions in the chat, please? Um, here's one. As Clinton noted, belonging is an issue. What can a school or department do to be more welcoming for all? So let me tell you something that my area does. We've had a lot of uh, programming, a lot of virtual programming since March holding community circles for students so they can talk about their experiences, meet other people, that kind of thing. But offices such as mine, and, and I'm not the only office that does this, right? There are other offices as well, but we work on policies and procedures and all that kind of stuff, making sure that Georgia Tech is a, a welcoming place. I know I'm one of the staff people that monitors this program called Ethics Point. That is where all the, not all, but uh, complaints of harassment or discrimination, uh, they, they come that way. I'm able to look at those and work with Dean Stein and Dr. Irvin, our Chief Diversity Officer, to help respond to those, just to make people aware of what some of the issues are. And just being there for students, right? Just meeting them where they are and giving them a place to just come and just be themselves, right? You could, you don't have to do any code switching to come to my office. You can just be who you are. And hopefully most students will say that student diversity programs is a welcoming uh, environment uh, for all students. So that's what I say, you know, working many of, my staff and myself, we, we serve on a number of committees to help bring about change. We are advocates for the underserved and the underrepresented, and also just an advocate for students in general. We're student life, so we're trying to be advocate for students. You know, one of the agendas right now, the Black students want some type of cultural center. So I've been a part of some of those discussions. They, they want a place. They want a place where they can just be, right? And so just advocating for them um, is just something that I truly enjoy doing. I too, at one time, was a black student on a predominantly white campus. Other question you see, Julian? Uh, it says uh, for graduate panelists, so I guess that's me. Um, <laughs> how would you promote an initiative to increase statistics for undergrads to continue their academic endeavors at Tech? So I guess that's like a retention, matriculation from undergrad into graduate, probably. Um, I, I, again, I came from a, a school that was really doing this brilliantly. And to your point, Dean Ray, um, we had a huge cultural center and I was shocked at how small BSO is. I was really shocked when I came here, given all the money that Georgia Tech has. Um, but that's another conversation. Julia, uh, tell, tell the parents what BSO is. They don't know BSO. It's a uh, office for the black student organizations, I believe. Yes. Um, so like Nesby and a couple, the undergrads will be able to tell you better than I will, but a number of black student organizations have their offices in there. Um, and so in terms of like this in, this idea of matriculation, I've seen pipeline programs work really brilliantly when they're invested in. Um, so uh, I've seen programs where as you apply into the undergraduate program, you get, you get saved a seat into that same PhD program, um, or maybe you can apply within your junior year or something so you can get an early admission. Um, and then also cultivating the talent in the interest in academia, uh, if you talk to any of the PhD students in biomedical engineering, the vast majority of them are not staying in academia. They're actually going into industry. Um, and part of that is because of uh, right, this culture of inclusivity as well. Folks are seeing how people are being treated in academia and not wanting to deal with that. <laughs> but it's also because the, the pipeline isn't there, right? Um, so we can work we, we in the BME program specifically. I can talk about this. We have really strong recruitment efforts around biomedical engineering undergraduate students. 
Um, we have a black professor who graduated from Georgia Tech's PhD program, Dr. Platt, leading those efforts in recruitment. However, <laughs> that the, the concentration of black students in the undergraduate program is not directly translating to the PhD program, right? So I think you identified a very important issue. Um, and I again, I'm, I'm going to say pipeline pro pro programs like a thousand times. And really what pipeline programs encompass are resources that actually develop students from one stage into another, giving them test prep, giving them early research opportunities and giving them funds so that they can stay in academia because being here again is not cheap. And I'll just cut it off there. <laughs> Thank you, Jillian. Pop yes, I was going to you, Clinton. You're next because I think when I asked Clinton about his involvement, one of the things that he was able to tell me is the research that he's doing as an undergraduate. So a lot of our students, I think a lot of students of color don't understand that how you could be a researcher at the undergraduate level. And that's so important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of our students don't see research as student engagement, but it is right. So Clinton, speak speak to your experience with undergraduate research. Sure. So yeah, I, I want to um, emphasize two points. So Julian mentioned uh, the BSO uh, currently. I, well, yeah, before like the student center underwent renovation, it was a very small like corner space in the student center, which was very shocking when I first learned about it, because if you see the black community, we're technically small, but we're really big at the same time. So that was alarming. I'm hoping we have a space in the new student center. I'm not entirely sure. Um, OK, we do. Cool. Um, so yeah, to piggyback off of Julian's uh, statement about um, pipeline. Yeah, he mentioned Dr. Platt, who was like the epitome of pipelining black students into research. He caught me when I was just 16 years old when I was in high school and he encouraged me to uh, do research through his program known as Project Engages and it's specific to um, I think about six or seven Atlanta high schools now and they basically allow high school students from those areas to conduct research at Georgia Tech and I did that when I was 16 and I've been doing research ever since and I'm 21 now. So like that's kind of the, the equivalent of earning my PhD, if you will. Um, so yeah, and I think it's kind of specific to the BME department because Dr. Platt is in the BME department, but I think programs can be translated to other departments on Georgia Tech's campus. Like there's a new one uh, funded by the National Institute of Health known as Esteemed, and it started during um, my first year as a tech student. And their entire goal is to um, incentivize students to um, pursue PhDs, particularly of minority backgrounds. And so uh, it's still up and coming, but I think it's making a huge difference because I, I can tell you now I don't want to be a professor and I think it's largely due to the fact that the BME department literally only has three black professors, two men and one woman. So it's in terms of representation, it's just really hard to see myself in that space. So if I do earn my PhD, I'm hoping things change to the point where it would maybe pivot me towards a different direction. Next question I want to ask you, what is something that looking back you wish you had known when you started Georgia Tech? What is something you wish you had known that you know now when you had started Georgia Tech? Uh, sure, I have another response. So I think coming into tech, it was high school was relatively easy, so to speak. So um, failures were not that common. And I think coming like after three and a half years at Tech, it's kind of like you you become more acclimated to the um, to the sense of failure. And it's it shouldn't be regular, of course, but you know when it does happen, it shouldn't like take you by surprise or it shouldn't uh, completely demotivate you um, as a student. So it's so one thing I wish I knew was it's OK to make mistakes and you're it's not going to be 
the end of the world if you make a single or even a few mistakes in a semester. So just being kinder to yourself will um, will go a, a very long way. Well, then thank you for saying that, Samata. Yeah, and I'll add when you do have those failures, I think one thing I wish I would have known is that the Dean of Students office is not just for when you get in trouble. I tell every single one of my mentees, even if you're feeling like a little unsure of yourself, book that meeting with Dean Ray. Like it's so helpful, especially in your undergrad years, because whether it's something that's severe, like maybe a health issue, or if it's something just maybe you're not feeling yourself when you're on campus, that one conversation can go a long way because you find out about the many, many resources that are out there. But additionally, it's not just something that um, that you have to deal with on your own. It's something that the Dean of Students Office can also filter that conversation between you and your professors if you're just not sure how to communicate anything that's going on. Um, and yeah, just having that one conversation, I think that you don't have to wait until you hit rock bottom um, to reach out and get help. As soon as you're starting to feel a little unsure, go and see what's out there that could help you. Thank you, Salmata. I just want to reiterate what Clinton said and I'll get back to Julia is that a lot of times I think students who come to tech and I was one of those students who I was known for my grades. For a very long time, I was known to be the smartest child at my school, right? The smartest student at my school. I remember I had one B in high school. The rest were A's. My B was in typing. Um, and, and then just, you know, I didn't make my first C for a very long time. And I really thought that C was a failure. And I know that a lot of my students, probably some on this call, think the very same thing. But you've got to learn that it's OK to make a C. It's even OK to make a D. Let's get real. It's even OK to make a F if that's what you earned. But you've got to go back and figure out how to pick yourself back up off that floor and try again. And one of the hardest things that we do to ourselves is, is we, we, we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. I always tell my students that the world will be hard enough on you. I need you not to be so hard on yourself. I think too, for me, I, I even felt like I might be letting other black people down or other students who are to come after me and letting my family down was was another kind of fear that I had as well. Can any of you speak? Is there an expectation that that you that you've ever felt? Julian? <laughs> mm hmm. I've never uh, cried as much about school as I did when I came to Georgia Tech. Absolutely not. I didn't cry a single time in undergrad. And in my first two years, I did three times and I called my parents and I said, I feel like I'm failing, I feel like I'm failing you. And, you know, my, my mom would always tell me my, my grandmother got it only got what finished school in second grade and left and started working. Um, and my mom would always tell me that my grandmother could have never imagined that I was in a PhD to be in a PhD program. So that was weighing on me. <laughs> um, and I felt like I was letting a whole gang of people down who got me where I am. Cause like I said, I came through pipeline programs. I was in a high school research program. So I know how much has been invested in me, but at the same time, you can't be successful coming from a place of guilt and shame. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and what I was gonna say earlier was that um, at least a third of the time that I spend as a student, I'm trying to build relationships. I feel like relationships will take you far, take you really, really far. And if I had never met Dean Ray and, you know, Dr. Page in the BME program and so many other folks, like flat out, I would not have been there. Even if my merits were up here because of the identities that we hold and the experiences we come with, folks will absolutely try to doubt you try to push you out all these things. And it's the relationships that keep you here. It's the relationships that keep you sticky. Um, and I had great people like Dean Ray affirming me 
even in some of the lowest moments I've had in this program. Um, so those relationships are absolutely why I'm still here. So I just wanted to add that on top of some Samada's point. So a lot of, a lot of what I do um, is working students who come to my office. A lot is going on, right? They're presenting in so many ways, a lot. They're upset. They don't know where to go. They don't know, know where to turn. But for the for these parents here, what do you need to hear from your parents? What can parents do to support you? Because a lot of times you don't even want your families to know what's going on. You want to figure it out yourself because you know, of course, why wouldn't you? You are exceptionally bright people, right? So let's talk about because parents want to help, but they don't know where to step in. Talk. Yes, Morgan, go Morgan, help me out here. So definitely I will say like through my journey at Tech, like my parents have been like 100% supportive. Like even when I had like those moments where I failed like my first exam and I was like, oh, my mom girl, like, oh my God, I failed. I don't think I'm supposed to be here. And she, you know, just kind of gave me that like reaffirmation, like, no, you made it here for a reason. It's just, you know, a minor setback and you're going to be good. But another thing I think that will really help with parents is, I don't, how do I say this? So I know like as an, like when I came in, I know like the advice to like tech students is like usually to take like 15 credits or under to like, you know, keep your mental health up. And so like when I was kind of like, going through scheduling like my classes and my parents kind of looked at them they like looked at my classes they were like why are you only taking you know 12 13 credits why aren't you taking more and like just kind of having to explain to them that you know not to sound like you know at least sort of like this is georgia tech like these classes are you know extremely hard and just kind of like getting or just like basically like parents having that understanding like you know like this school isn't like, you know, your college or just in general, like Georgia Tech is extremely hard and can be extremely taxing, especially during COVID with online classes, like all of it is really, really hard. And just like, yes, you know, I know a lot of parents want to see us like graduate in four years, taking, you know, credits, getting, you know, internship research, that type of stuff. But, you know, just kind of like telling your student, you know, it's okay. Like coming to tech, I learned that, you know, one, that people take under 15 credits and two, a lot of people who don't come in with a lot of credits from doing enrollment, you know, they graduate in four and a half years and that's okay because, you know, your time here is your time here. And it's really important to get that good foundation in, you know, to exit Georgia Tech mentally sane, you know, essentially. So, I mean, definitely my advice with parents is just to, you know, be understanding of your student when they are like, going through like register like you know registering for classes and definitely like you know being there for when they do have those really really hard moments on campus thank you morgan i really appreciate that salmata and then clinton yeah i'll just add quickly i mean coming from an african household the pressure was definitely always on to be successful um just because of the line of being an immigrant and like having siblings who are looking up to me as the eldest, the pressure was definitely on. But one thing that I think my mom did very well, that I hope other parents do as well, was just making sure that I prioritized my health first. Um, as much as she wanted me to be successful, she would always say like, you're not gonna make that A laying on your deathbed. So make sure that you're coming back to your dorm, eating those three meals. And I think if you place that value on them as a student holistically, and making sure they're doing well in those other aspects of their lives, then that'll filter back to their grades and how they do in school. Thank you, Clinton. Yeah, um, I think in my particular experience, I'm an only child, right? So growing up, all the attention was literally on me and it still is to this day because I'm still an only child. And so I think my parents had a hard time grasping exactly the beast that is Georgia Tech because no one else in my family has come to this school. They graduated from college, but they went to different schools. So I think one time I got like a 75 on an exam and I was just casually talking to my parents about like my experience in school and they were like, Clinton, that's low. This was also my first year too, so they really weren't familiar. And they're like, Clinton, that's just too low. And I'm like, 
No, I was pretty happy with my 75 because the average was a 67. So I was like, um, yeah, that's 75. If you curve that, that's probably going to be an A, but they didn't realize it. And so I like showed them what the exam looked like and they were like, OK, yeah, you got it. We're, we'll never say anything else like for as long as you're in school. And I'm like, thank you. I appreciate that. So I think once they realized just how difficult uh, school particularly at tech can be um, they were much more supportive and a little more lenient in the sense yeah when i was i'll call you next julian yeah when i was in school i was not a stem major so i was always taking 17 and 18 credits a semester right sometimes that's what if i could take 17 and 18 credits plus i was working then why can't you take 17 or 18 credits right so that's a that's that's a good uh, observation julian yeah, really briefly, um, my parents, uh, my parents did a complete 180. I felt like when I joined the PhD program, I don't think they fully appreciated how hard school is and stuff until I got here. Uh, my, you know, my parents are from Jamaica and Anguilla, so same thing with like the ridiculously high standards. But um, the thing that like completely changed how I was looking at my performance was that they said. Um, that the PhD in any degree will never make me great and that I was already great. And that <laughs> completely shifted how I was looking at the program. I was like, you know what? Y'all are right. <laughs> this is only going to help me if I don't want to finish. You know, I will still be just as great as I was when I came here and all this thing. So um, that was really helpful to hear. Thank you. Julian, is there a question in the chat we need to answer? Yeah, Tyler put a question here, actually. Um, would anyone mind speaking on the Greek life culture at Tech for Black students? Any benefits of pursuing to join a NPHC organization or a multicultural Greek organization? Yeah, that was one of our questions. I'm so glad someone asked that question. Anyone want to speak to that? I mean... I Go ahead, as, Clinton. as far as I know, none of none of us is involved in any of that. But um, I will say their presence on campus makes a difference. Uh, just knowing the history behind uh, the NPHC culture, like they're all about service and uh, they're very um, community oriented. So uh, having them uh, alongside of us in terms of uh, black student organizations is really is really cool because uh, when I was growing up and I was aspiring to go to college I always knew about like black Greek life and um, and how important they were to African American culture so uh, the fact that we even have them is is a positive in itself and I think their involvement uh, makes a huge difference in terms of a student's black a black student's experience here at Tech. I am a member of an MPHC organization and I've advised MPHC groups on campus. I put in the chat the name of someone, Janice McKenzie. She works for Fraternity and Sorority Life and she actually advises the MPHC and multi multicultural Greek organizations. So if you have a question, I would ask that you probably want to have a conversation with Janice and she can tell you all about it. Also, just to throw something out there, we have a number of black students who are in IFC organizations or what we call CPC organizations. So you don't just because you're black, you don't have to join an, NP, an NPHC or CPC organization and vice versa. So I just wanted to put that out there. Julian, anything else you see? you know it, it varies from individual to individual right it's it's about finding the best fit for you because we don't have the same experiences so our desires and needs are not going to be the same as well so let's talk about i want to talk about grades a little bit so what are some tips and strategies for making good grades salmata yeah, definitely utilizing the center for um, the Success Center um, at Georgia Tech. I think they have a lot of good resources that are sort of passive that you don't necessarily need to make an appointment for. For example, the semester at a glance guidelines that go out, they have like a 
cardstock copy of the semester and all the important days. Just kind of jot anything that's going to affect your grades. So not your day to day business sort of. They have um, dedicated resources for that as well, but it's definitely a nice just clutch thing to glance at, set as your phone wallpaper. Um, additionally, if you do make a meeting um, at the Success Center, they definitely do a good job of making sure that you're in control of what you want out of what you define as academic success and kind of build upon what your goals are for that semester. And then you kind of have someone to hold you accountable as you make those follow up meetings. So I would say utilizing that. So they have uh, academic coaching there and they have uh, some tutoring there as well, tutoring at OMED. Anything else, your tips for making good grades? And staying on track too. Um, I can go. So definitely, like Samada said, like academic success in there because I personally, like I have one of the um, semester at a glances and like I write down all of my major like projects, tests, deadlines, and I keep that like, you know, posted up in my room so I can kind of look at it and I won't get overwhelmed when I see I have like, you know, two tests like in the same week and I'm like, okay, I can kind of prepare for that. Also, um, just getting help early, like even though the semester just started and you feel like, you know, you understand it, still, you know, go to office hours, build that relationship with your professors so they know who you are, they know your face, like even if you don't have questions, like sitting in on office hours and like hearing what other people ask, you know, can be really helpful because maybe you're kind of like, oh, I didn't, you know, even think about that and I'm glad I got that insight. Um, so yeah, like I said, definitely getting help. And then like you said, Dean Ray, like OMED, I personally like OMED for tutoring because it is on a smaller scale and it's easier for me to make appointments and that works better for me than going to the, um, the cult when you have to, Pretty much, well, not to deter people, but it is like you might have to wait or you might have to um, schedule appointments uh, like a couple of days in advance. But yeah, definitely getting help early and not waiting till, you know, you have your test and it's like, okay, let me start, you know, reaching out to people who are getting tutoring like the day or two days before, essentially. Okay, Julian and then Clinton. Yeah, I was just going to. Uh, underscore the importance of those relationships again. I feel like the difference between a B plus and an A minus is sometimes the benefit of the doubt. As a former educator, I used to be a middle school science teacher. Um, I know that there's this like bias when you know for a fact that the student wants to do well. And if you never communicate that to your professor, unfortunately, sometimes they will not push you over that little edge that you need. Um, that can make a, a major difference. The other thing is that um, those relationships, again, <laughs> you should communicate with your professors not just when you need help from them, but also when you're enjoying something that they're doing. Also, if you find an article that you think they'd be interested in, those are things that are real relationships that do not feel transactional. And I've been able to get letters of recommendation and all kinds of things from professors even if I wasn't, you know, the top student in the class would because they knew I, I like passionately cared about the content. And there's no greater affirmation for an academic than knowing that their students care deeply about the things that they're saying, right? So I would definitely um, um, push that button as much as you can without, you know, overwhelming anybody or anything. Clinton? Uh, yeah, speaking of relationships, I think the most important relationship you can have in college is with yourself. And I think uh, at, in college and specifically at Georgia Tech, there seems to be this. People tend to like sensationalize being extremely busy all day, every day of the week. And I definitely fell into that trap like my first two, my first two years. I was like, OK, if I'm not doing something every hour, of the day, then then I'm clearly wasting my time and that it doesn't have to be that way because work life balance is is extremely important in terms of uh, maintaining productivity and not burning out by your second year like I did and needing the summer to completely rejuvenate yourself. So um, I think if people like know themselves enough to where they know how hard to push and how hard not to push themselves can also uh, be extremely beneficial and not falling into the trap of needing to be busy all the time because downtime is extremely important, particularly for your mental health and scheduling time for yourself is also really important. 
mental health is real, you all. Mental health is real on our campus and, and in the greater society as, as well. So how do you how do you engage in self-care? How do you all engage in self-care? I'm not saying you do it. I'm just asking, first of all, do you and what do you do? Especially during COVID. Co COVID just put another level to, to stress, right? It added a whole new layer. And a lot of times, um, you know, folk in the black community, we, we sometimes don't take care of ourselves in the way that we, we should or we could. So Morgan, want to speak to that? Yes, and it kind of like goes off of what Clinton was saying about like, you know, it's okay to have downtime. When it comes to studying for like exams or just in general, or like, you know, you're doing work, please give yourself a break, whether it be like, one, please eat, definitely. Like, you know, you still need to be mentally strong and also like don't because when you study or when you try to cram for like long periods of the day, like you one, you're not going to retain that information and two, you're going to easily burn out. So definitely incorporating those breaks into studying that definitely helped me. Um, another thing that I do personally. So for my breaks, when it comes to studying, I try to like maybe watch an episode or something like on Netflix or like, you know, some like YouTube just to like kind of get those mental breaks. And also um, now that I'm a second year and I like I'm in a um, student apartment, I've been cooking. So that's definitely been a big stress reliever for me, especially on Sundays, because, you know, I'm away from home. I still kind of want those Sunday dinners. So like I schedule some time off in the evening and just cook to my heart's content dinner and like making myself dessert. Definitely. That's what I do. Thank you. Anyone else? Clinton. Yeah, um, I think, well, yeah, as you can probably see, I have a very extensive uh, vinyl collection behind me. So at the end of every day, I just pop one of these bad boys onto a record player and I just sit and literally listen to music. And for me, music was always like my first love, but um, but science like put food on the table. So I always go back to my roots of music and like being a musician. I also have a piano like right next to me that I'll play from time to time just to like take my mind off of all things school related. Thank you. Julian, are, is there any other questions we should answer before we offer our final comments? I'm going to say this, and I, I had a slide prepared, but I'm not going to go over it. Being in student life for over 30 years, if I could always pinpoint why students aren't successful, number one is they don't have resilience. And you all know, students, you if you don't have it, you've got to develop it. You have to be able to bounce back when something doesn't go your way. Because you don't have the option to give up. You may restart and refocus and go in a different direction, but but you don't have the option to give up. That's not an option. So you must have some resilience. And secondly, the other reasons why students are not successful, in my opinion, is they don't take advantage of resources. So at the first sign of trouble, at the first sign, if you feel different in some way, the first sign that ah something's not going right with this professor, you need to let someone know immediately so you can have some assistance and guidance on that. We're here to support you and to help you. You don't have to figure everything out yourselves. I do want to let the families know that we in our office, the Dean of Students office, we have an emergency fund called the Dean Griffin Hip Pocket Loan where students can can borrow up to $1,000 and pay it back in 14 weeks without any interest. You know, those little things come up. You need a car repair. You might need a passport. You might need to pay for a study abroad fee. Things that come up, then that's a great place for that. We also have an um, a student emergency fund um, that parent, Georgia Tech parents and Georgia Tech administration both put monies into this fund to help with COVID relief. 
and a student can get up to a $750 grant that they don't have to pay back. So if you can pay, prove that your need is tied to COVID, say your family member has a loss of income or you don't have an income, you were supposed to have a co-op job, but, but the job um, it, 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 it was, was taken away, then you can get up to $750 to help you fund those things. So we thank you for your time and these students, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you and you taking the time out of your busy schedules because this, this panel would not have, I don't think been as beneficial to parents without you students being present. So thank you, thank you everyone. Again, my name is Dean Stephanie Ray and put my name in the chat. I'm also going to put my direct number to my office. Four zero four eight nine four eight nine one eight, and do not hesitate to call me if you need anything. So thank you for attending this panel discussion and the best is yet to come. I promise you. Bye bye.